my manager, I remember distinctly coming and saying, okay, here is a set of manuals, technical manuals, mm-hmm. read it for one week. And then after that, from the second week, go out and sell. I said, what, and no sales training? And essentially he said, well, have you ever come across a situation where you had a brilliant idea, a groundbreaking product or a life changing service, but you struggled to get others on board? Well, my friends, that's where the magic of selling comes in. Welcome back to Maven Talks. I'm your host, Rakshit Kharwanna. And for today's episode, we have a guest who has mastered the art of selling and has inspired countless professionals in this field. We are privileged to learn from one of the industry's finest person, Mr. Deva Rangarajan. Throughout this episode, we will dwell deeper into the key milestones that shaped his career, his early experiences as a salesman, building resilience in the face of rejection, understanding customer needs, and recommending resources for aspiring salespeople. Hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more such captivating episodes. Let's dive in. Can you take a moment to introduce yourself to the listeners and tell us about who you are and what we do it? So my name is Deva Rangarajan. Uh, I am a professor of sales at IESAG School of Management in Paris, France. Uh, but I've been in the teaching profession for the past 20 years. So I have taught at business schools in Belgium and in uh, France, of course, now in the U.S., uh, but I also am a visiting professor. I've been a visiting professor at schools in Italy, in South Africa. Uh, of course, uh, my home country of India, you could have possibly guessed with a name like mine and with accent of mine. But my journey into uh, academia uh, was not something that was planned. Uh, so essentially, I am from India and around 1996, I graduated with my first degree in engineering and ended up with a job in sales and saw that I actually liked combining the technical skills with the idea of talking to people and trying to help them solve issues with the products that I could sell. Uh, I liked it a lot more, enough to the point I ended up going to the United States to pursue my PhD. Uh, and then, of course, uh, once you start doing a PhD, then, of course, you start going into that domain. And so uh, that's how I came into sales. Okay. And I want to know more about your first experience as a salesman. So was it like a disaster or was it like really good? Of course. The fact is that, see, uh, I'll tell you something that now I teach a class in sales. But uh, way back in 1996, when I actually got into the workforce, uh, we did not have any class in sales. What we had uh, was something on project management, which is, again, one small course in an in engineering curriculum. Right? Now, this is something that is also true not just in India, but in many, many parts of the world, even today, where sales is usually either relegated to business school one or two classes, or uh, in some places in Europe, it's not even taught at universities. It's taught in uh, vocational schools, right? So when I began, there was no sales training. So essentially, I go in and I got a job. Uh, the job said sales trainee. I was just happy to get a job. Uh, and then I go in and the first day, essentially what my manager says is that gives me, uh, I was working for a very technical company that sold industrial pumps. And my my manager, I remember distinctly coming and saying, okay, here is a set of manuals, technical manuals, mm-hmm. read it for one week. And then after that, from the second week, go out and sell. I said, what, and no sales training? And essentially he said, well, we are a monopoly in the market. So whatever le- training you're going to get, you're going to get training on the job by making mistakes. And then because the customer does not have a choice, because they were a monopoly, right? So essentially, uh, that was my first idea of what training was. I just stumbled onto it. And when you don't have formal training, you do have some coaching. My manager did speak to me once in a while about things I should do, I should not do. But most of the time is you learn on the job. Mm. Uh, And it helps if you work for a company that is very, very well known in your feet, right? The fact is that there are so many business to business companies that people have not even heard of but are so big in their field, so it helps. So did I make a lot of mistakes? Absolutely, yes. But I also learned a lot. Uh, You also learn that uh, selling is a life skill, uh, that things that you can learn while you are doing the sales process. If you think about it a little bit more over, you've always been doing it in your personal life. So that's what I did, uh, being becoming more organized, being able to listen more in the initial part of a conversation, 
being able to empathize uh, with the people in front of you and understand that no two people are alike. You, mean, you knew it all along. It's only when you are there in a sales job you learn all. Okay. Well, I actually have an interesting story. So uh, this weekend I was traveling back to Sochi with my friends and I was like, I'm interested in finance or uh, investment banking. Mm -hmm. And my friend told me that you can't be in investment banking because you're too nice for it. Mm -hmm. And what he wanted to tell me is that in sales, you are not always selling something that you know is good for the customers. So even with like your company, you are a part of a monopoly. But when you start as a salesman, it might not always be the case that what you're selling to your customer, you know, it's nice for him. It might be bad for him, such as an investment banker selling an investment. So what do you do in such position? Yeah. This is a very, very interesting question, right? And and essentially, the, the answer I'm going to tell you is usually what I say in class, which I've come to believe in after a, a period of skepticism as well, which is you only sell what you believe in, right? You need to make sure that you are confident that you are looking out for the best interest of the person who is trusting you as well, right? You always you have to treat people the way you would like to be treated yourself. So why would you make investments uh, if you're an investment banker, right? On something that is very very risky, when you would not put your own money in it, right? So in my opinion, you should not be selling something that you do not believe in, right? Now that is for you to be able to sleep well at night. Let's say for example, you can sleep well at night saying that I had to do it because I had I have a job that pays for the bills. And that pays for all the other things that I want that is essential in life. Now, when if you even go with that, if you sell something to a client that the client feels that they're cheated on or they felt that they got a wrong deal and you were responsible for it, right? In this day and age, they can actually take to social media. You mm -hmm. can go in and slander. They could slander you. Uh, they could say a lot of things. Of course, we also are living increasingly in a very litigious society, so which means that they could sue you as well in the, you know, if they have the things on their side. So I think that either way, for, for uh, the fact is that even uh, in terms of forget the fact that you should have an ethical value and you should actually be very careful about what you do to the others, but you should also be, even if you don't necessarily have that and you have ways to justifying it, understand that your reputation could go for a toss and a short-term gain will not compensate for a long-term loss in terms of your credibility and people's willingness to trust in you. When you say that, do you mean like sales as a long-term game, long-term game or a short-term game? Everything. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, you feel that, of course, there's a short-term gain sometimes if you can do it, but the short-term gains ultimately should be weighed against the long-term uh, gains as well. You can take short term, you can earn a lot of money, but you could earn a lot of bad will as well. But as goodwill for me, in my opinion, mm. will never go waste. Yeah. If I help a client or forget it, helping a client, if I'm helping a colleague, I'm helping them knowing very well that in some instances that I will not get anything from it in the long run. But you will pretty much uh, leave a lasting impression on that individual or set of individuals that if they get a chance, that they will repay it back to you unless they're sociopaths, which is, uh, again, we're not going to talk about that. I believe inherently in the goodness of people. Are all people good? Not necessarily. I mean, how do I define bad? That is if they're not good to me, but maybe they have, they're good in other things, but I would like to believe in the good of people and you do your best, and you always uh, try to help others as best as you can. Okay, that's interesting. And uh, you were mentioning about social media. Mm -hmm. So things like social media and e-commerce weren't relevant when you started into sales. So how do you think that has changed the whole uh, sales landscape? And what advice do you have for professionals who want to be accustomed to these changes? I think that the fact is that, see, technology has evolved drastically, right? So, for example, e-commerce, as you know it today, has been there for quite some time. If you define how it depends on how you define e-commerce, we've always had this idea of electronic data interchange, for example, uh, that a client, uh, in a, even in a business-to-business -business context, likes buying from the same supplier again and again to the point where they buy the same thing again and again. 
and they just don't, they don't have to go to a website. They get an idea and internet that they can just go place an order there. That's essentially technology has evolved from there, where again it could be very transactional, right? But you could also go into where you can actually look at uh, through e-commerce and through your buying behaviors. You can actually also build a kind of a knowledge about the customers. But that's not you as an individual, but you as a company can build knowledge about your customers in terms of e-commerce in a B business to business context. In a B2C context, of course, there's essentially, uh, if I want to have traffic on my site or people to come and buy, I need to then use tools like social media to build my personal brand, mm. right? So the idea of building a personal brand was not something that is uh, relatively, uh, what can I say, uh, easy to access platforms to. I'm not saying it's easy to build it. You have easy access to platforms. Okay using social media to build a personal brand, it's still an art form, right? But we, when I was in the profession, the early part of my professional life, we didn't have that. You built it the old fashioned way. You go at client to client or customer to customer or student batch to student batch. In my case, I was a professor, right? Student batch to student batch. And you build it up based on that. Today, social media are platforms where you can actually showcase your talent, uh, your skill set, your knowledge, your persona uh, into ways where you can build your personal brand and that can help you a lot in actually the sales process. And the sales process could be short term. What is a sales process? It could very well be that when I want to get access to one particular client, just opening the door is a initial sale of making the customer say, okay, I want to talk, talk to you. You can also use social media to actually now say, okay, is that, is Rakshit the person that I actually want to go talk to? I can also do, well, that he is an ideal profile for me to be reaching out to. So essentially social media can also be ways by which I can reach out and build my personal brand. And hopefully that answers your question. In yeah. House. And, and that's essentially what it is. The purpose of all this is it could be e-commerce, it could be social media, it could be things like uh, account-based marketing, which are tools or marketing automation, email. The key is not about the technology. The key is about what do we use it for uh, or to make sure that we go after the right profiles of clients and customers with the right kind of content that is going to help them make sense of the challenges that they face. Okay. Just to summarize, if I understand it better, I think a lot of us have even if I talk about, say, 10 companies, they have similar tools uh -huh. they're going after with, they are uh, they basically have the same information. Yeah. So it's not about uh, what information you have, it's about how you use that information yeah. to make a sale or basically reach Absolutely. out to your customer. It, it, the, it, and one of the things that you, it's a buzzword right now is customer centricity, right? The customer centricity is, okay, who are my customers? Hmm. What to so the who? What do they want? Where can I create value? How am I different? And how do I deliver on the value? This is customer centricity, right? And, and the salesperson has a role to play in each one of these, not alone. But again, you know, they take in English, there's a thing, I think it says it takes a village to raise a child. So you need a whole organization uh, to work together with the salesperson to make that happen. Uh, I think uh, salespeople need to build relationships with the customers as much as uh, within their own organization. And that for me is what the, is the essence of sales. Okay, amazing. Um, I think a lot of people don't look at uh, sales as a way to start or make their careers yeah. because uh, they are afraid of a lot of rejections. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's said that sales is not for faint hearted people. Yes. And the thing is that uh, like since sales can be a challenging field and rejection is a common occurrence, how can salespeople develop uh, resilience and, and overcome that. Yeah. The fact that it's really interesting you talk about how we take it rather personally when uh, you go get into sales. I mean, I'm guilty of it. Right? I still sometimes have problems with it right after having been in the profession for so long. But the fact is that when we were young, you tried to convince your parents, I'm at least talking about my case, uh, you tried to convince your parents about what it is that you think is correct and that you want. You got shot down so many times. Right? Does it mean that you love your parents any less? No. But does it mean that you stop asking them for things? Maybe at some point when you get older, but maybe but you continue doing it, you learn from it, you say, what is the best way to persuade them? Do we need to have better arguments? 
to actually deal with it. And at, at the end of the day, the parent is probably saying no at that time. Right? But again, now, now, same thing. You start going up and then essentially if you do not, since I come from India, we have the, we have this idea of arranged marriages. But if you choose not to have it, then of course you try your luck with somebody that you like and you also get rejected. Does it mean that you get, so you get one rejection and that's it? You, like, there's some people who just give up, but then you try, keep trying on. Same thing with sales. Except that when it sales, they are not rejecting you. They are rejecting what it is that you're trying to persuade them about in terms of products or services and things like that. Now, of course, uh, for you to understand this and learn from your mistakes, you also need a very, very understanding organization or a sales manager, now in a professional context, mm -hmm. right? To be able to explain to you that you have to kind of decouple why they don't buy from you and not take it personally, how to deal with this, what you learn from this. And if you have that kind of an organization that you work with, which has a learning mentality, then you are in good shape. Again, that's what it doesn't mean that you cannot do it by yourself, but it's then you need a resilience in terms of saying, okay, as long as you have a learning orientation saying what went right, what went wrong, can I change it? At some point, then what can I do different? That is what is going to help you and not take it personal. That's a very easy thing to say, very hard to implement. But what can I learn from this? How would I do things differently? If you don't have that mindset, it does not matter if it's sales or anything else, you're going to have a lot of issues. Yeah, I think whether you like it or not, everybody of has been selling at some point. Like you mentioned about uh, when we were young, asking for, say, some gift, some tricycle or something yeah. like those parents again and again in different ways. Even like today, whether you are a work for professional who's uh, looking for an internship or job, you're again selling your skill set. If you are on a date, you are selling yourself necessarily. So whether we like it or not, we have already been in sales. And what do you think are like the essential qualities that every successful salesman should possess? Uh, let me begin with every sales individual has to be a human being first. That's my opinion. Uh, so which means that uh, you have to have certain values. Uh, hopefully the values include helping the customers and helping yourself along the way. It's perfectly fine for you to look out for yourself but you cannot look out for yourself uh, at the expense of somebody else. That's for me is one of the things, right? Uh, of course, you should be self-starters. So essentially sales is going to be one of those professions where you're most of the time your boss is not going to always say, what did you do yesterday? What did you do day before yesterday? They're going to expect you to know how to manage your time. So you have to be a self-starter. So you're almost like an entrepreneur, except that you are an entrepreneur within an organization and you have your territory, you have to go sell, and that's pretty much what it is. Uh, you should be a great listener. Uh, you should be very, very learning oriented. Uh, of course, you mentioned resilience. Uh, I think increasingly you have to be very creative uh, because uh, uh, increasingly, uh, if I just go sell the normal way that I sell today with things like chat GPT and the customers increasingly being able to even uh, dictate what they're looking for and getting that kind of stuff, your ability to challenge the customer and you know what I mean? and be creative in your solution is something that uh, you have to really build in. And I once spoke to a person, he says that v sales people should be value deconstructors. So essentially, they should be able to break, break down the value that you give to the customer to the nitty gritty part and the nuts and bolts of it. So that if you can do it, then depending on what the customer says, you can build it up again. They according to what the customer wants. So your ability to be creative in that way uh, is very, very important. And of course, listening, as I already said, uh, listening and then of course, emotional intelligence. Uh, that is, uh, how do I uh, maintain my emotional composure when dealing with difficult clients? Uh, how do I respond to my clients? Uh, how do I don't give into emotions and react rationally? Uh, that is again, something that in my opinion is very important. Okay. And a lot of qualities that you talked about, uh, a lot of say values, mm -hmm. uh, it's something that you are born with, like you, you either have them or you don't. So yeah. are you trying to say that either you are a good salesperson or not, or is it something that you built along your career? I think the fact is that, for example, listening, it's not a, it's not a naturally born skill set for a lot of people. It's something that you train yourself to. But in order for me to listen, I should ask the right questions. Mm. Which means mm. that a good talker sometimes might not always be willing to 
ask the right questions. They just want to give dump information. So in my opinion, that is something that you can train people yeah. aim to do that. The other thing, of course, in sales is that um, if I don't ask the right questions, I may not get the right answers. I may not be able to sell. So it means that I should also be prepared to put in the hard work to be able to do the research for it. I cannot bluff my way out, at least not in these days and time, when customers maybe have access to more information about your offer and that of the competition. And if you bluff and the customer finds out, you've, you've lost face for yourself, your organization, and the, if the customer decides to tell other people about it, then essentially you've lost credibility in the market. So I think this is my opinion. I say a lot in my opinion because for me, that's what I think. It's such a scenario like building strong and lasting relationships, I guess, is the key. And how do you actually go beyond that initial sales where you build a loyal customer base? Well, you see, if you want to build a loyal customer base, it's just not the salesperson alone. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that is a salesperson, first of all, needs in this day and age, depending upon what you're selling, right? If it's a, if I'm talking about complex solutions, um, a salesperson uh, might need the help of people within their organization. Mm -hmm. To, you know, they could have technical people, they could have uh, people who are in operations, they could have people in marketing, you could have people in, in other different profile, other functions who have to come together to say, this is the kind of solution we want to provide to a client. And it's only up to the point of sale. Now, once the sale is made, you still have to deliver on the promises, right? There are so many things beyond the control of a salesperson uh, in terms of building a relationship. Now, what the salesperson can do is facilitate this kind of relationship building by building networks internal to the company. Okay. And that is with the different departments, with the different people, with different silos within the organization. Uh, it's also about how you build relationships with different people in the customer's organization. Now, sometimes you might reach out to the end customer through your distributors or partners or through other third parties that you have to then build a relationship with. So, so for example, I could sell something to a client, but in order for me to deliver that, I have to work with an external third party. And the client does not care that you work with an external third party. They just want to do business with you, which means then that I have to build my network, the third parties to provide the right kind of solution. So I think it's about network building either externally or internally. And how do you build networks? Is you build goodwill. Okay. And do you have like any techniques or like a go-to formula to basically... Uh, understand the needs of your customer. Of course, uh, it's it, it, in the sales profession. Of course, that's something that I use. Uh, one of the most widely used uh, questioning techniques, uh, which is spin. Okay. So that's something that I do talk about, and it's not something that I came up with. It's something that a very smart man called Neil Rackham came up with around forty plus years ago. Uh, but I still use it in terms of how. Uh, but the key is that being able to adapt according to the situation is what is very very important. That for me is key. Uh, in what and how I need to be successful there. So for me, that questioning technique and that practice is what is key. Okay, so what uh, what is spin for the listeners? Yeah. Listen? So the perfect sale is the one where the customer feels that they're buying something rather than they're being sold something. And so it's about making the customer realize that they have a problem or an issue or a challenge that if it's not kind of taken care of could lead to a lot of implications that's going to affect their bottom line. Right? Now, from that mindset, if you come in, and you can say the key then is that if the customer has to buy, then you have to make the customer realize that they have a problem. So essentially, by asking the right kind of questions, uh, uh, we just got off a class session right now where uh, one of the uh, people from a company was giving feedback to my students about their sales role plays. And he talked about how salespeople have to be psychiatrists. And what do psychiatrists do? They ask you a lot of questions. They probe, they probe, they probe. Uh, I've talked to other people who say uh, salespeople should be like accountants. Accountants, they, especially if you've done anything with taxes, if you or some of you, if you're very young enough not to have done taxes, and soon you will be paying taxes once you become a, an earning member of public of the public. You'll see that your accountants ask you a lot of information. They ask you a lot of questions. It's about asking questions. So essentially, SPIN is a method that is about asking the right kind of questions. It begins with trying to understand the situation of the person in front of you. That's the S. Then, of course, this once you get from the situation, you get a kind of a kind of an helicopter view of all the things that is happening. 
Then you start narrowing it down, so you start going into the level of the forest and even to the level of the trees. So what are the problems that they're facing? <laughs> Sorry. And every problem that a customer has, has an implication. So what impact does it have on their business? Hmm. And then uh, you then ask them permission to say, if there's a way by which you can help them, would they be interested? So essentially you kind of take them through the process where the customer feels that this is something that they need uh, to sort out as a problem or an issue. Okay. And do you have any actionable tips or strategies that you can implement to basically enhance your selling skills? Well, uh, I think the, the if you can do something is learn to ask the right kind of questions. Uh, learn to be very, very, very well prepared for a sales call. A call does not just reflect, or just, just not restricted to a call as a picking up the phone and calling. It is also about physically visiting clients. If I'm going to be I'm visiting a client, do a preparation for it before. Uh, it is also about knowing very well that things could change last minute. Uh, it is also about sometimes saying no to customers and what I will say no to. And if you do not know an answer to something, and that's very, very cultural, uh, where saying no to a client is okay rather than bluffing your way out. Uh, mm. uh, that if you do not know the answer, make sure that you set the expectations right, say that they're going to get back to them with the answer in a time frame and make sure you you stick to the time frame and come back to them with an answer. This, in my opinion, are some tricks. I think one of my professors, it was my negotiation professor, told me that if you want to be really good at selling something, whether it, mm -hmm. uh, whether you are a startup or a corporate, you need to understand your client's client. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, right? See, the fact is... Uh, See, in a person, so since you, when I teach a class on sales, I always talk about uh, personal relationships, right? So, for example, if there's a person that you really, really like, right, and that person uh, pays or uh, puts a lot of emphasis on how the, that they like you, but it's not just not about them, but they also have other family members whose opinion counts. Mm. The same thing, that's your customer's customer, right? That's essentially the are Similarly, in business, if I do not understand my customer's customer. So for example, if my customer's customer wants a very low price, there is no way that your customer is going to put up with a very, very high priced solution because they cannot pass it on. So it's not that they are a charity, but even a charity cannot go in loss because somebody they let you have to close the charity, right? So essentially, but you're talking about capital, capitalistic organization. So they need to make a profit. So if that's the case, if their customers are very price conscious, I should then adapt my solution to fit their needs. And if I'm selling to them, I should know what I should be offering them. So I should know what my customer's customer wants, mostly to know how I can push the right kind of levers. And in some instances, your customers themselves might not know what their customers want. Then you give an additional value to the client, which is not just restricted to the product or the service that you sell, but the knowledge that you bring to them for them to be successful in their job. And lastly, do you uh, could you share some top recommendations for book courses that you took maybe uh, once or anything that you could go out and learn about? Uh, well, there are so many. But, uh, again, as I said, uh, these days, there are so many kind of uh, blogs, uh, self-help websites and things like that. So for me, example, so since I, I must say that this is not a very, very... Uh, would thing to say in a, a medium like this, but I don't read too many books. I not desire here. Yeah. I have my own set of uh, fiction books that I like to read, but there are some books that I really, really like. So for example, when I talk about selling, I usually talk about uh, spin selling, right? There's another book called Selling to the Top. Mm -hmm. uh, when I talk about sales management, that is managing a sales team, my absolute Bible uh, or Bhagavad Gita, or uh, Zen Tavis, or whatever is the right the holy book for what is what getting to watch it um, is um, a book titled Building a Winning Sales Force. Uh, that's a great book, and of course, uh, I can provide you with the details. And your if your audiences are interested, of course, they can you can give them the list of this. And if I'm talking about the channel strategies and go to market strategies, there's another book, great book called. Uh, transforming your go-to-market strategy. So 
these are just some of the books that I, I do talk about. If it's more business to business marketing, it is also a, a book which is called Business to Business Marketing by Anderson and Nader. So there are some books that I really, really like. The other things, uh, are there good books? Absolutely, there are good books. But this day and age, with the way things are changing so rapidly and with chat GPT, you can maybe even get uh, summaries of those books or things like that very fast. So, Absolutely. Yeah, that was all from my side. Thank you so much for having me. Hopefully, in the end, uh, thank you so much for having me over. And uh, good luck with all your initiatives and these kind of things. I see your posts on LinkedIn periodically. And particularly like the one where you talked about, uh, hey, LinkedIn is all about talking to people talking about success. Exactly. But, yeah. uh, but nobody talks about uh, failure. It's, 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 I think it's a very, very relevant point. Uh, once in a while, uh, it also shows you that you're down to earth, humble, and are willing to learn. So good luck with everything that you do as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.